Hi guys, Robert here. This video is a complete guide to installing a PID controller on a Gadget Classic Pro. The modification is intended to be cheap, elegant and completely reversible. My aim was to have a stealthy PID mod that anyone can reproduce. This is a very long video, so I provided timestamps in the video description. My descent into the home espresso started with that wonderful James Hoffman video about buying a used Gaja Classic. I took the plunge and I've been a happy owner of this second-hand machine and grinder for two months now. Of course I started to modify it almost immediately. It already features the 9-bar spring mod, a stainless steel shower holder, a silicon gasket and bottomless porta filter with IMS basket. What was missing up until recently was a PID temperature controller. If you want a PID controller for your machine, you can buy a ready-made set of the internet. But this solution didn't appeal to me for two reasons. The first is the price, which I found just too steep. I know you are paying for the convenience and taking out the guesswork, and I understand that. But I was ready to invest some time into doing my own research and possibly finding a cheaper solution. The second reason is the looks. I really like the design of the machine, I think it stood the test of time and deserves to be called a classic. Most PID kits come as an aluminium extrusion box that is bolted to the side of the machine or placed on the top. I find that very crude, just makeshift. I didn't want to spoil the original design with something looking so industrial. Luckily, I was able to find a model for 3D printing a slimmer case. My PID unit is held by magnetic strips at the back of the machine and is only visible from up front. This is what you're gonna need. First up is the PID controller itself. This model is called XMT7100 and I bought it on AliExpress. It seems well put together and really tiny, I was actually a bit surprised by its size. It's much smaller than anticipated, which was great. It has 10 terminals for connections. Ports number 6, 7 and 8 are used to attach your temperature sensor. Terminals 9 and 10 are used to connect the PID to the relay. On the flip side, you'll find terminals used for a, for a second relay, the ground connection and terminals 1 and 2. Those will be used to provide the PID with power. I'll be using the PID to control the brew temperature, but you can modify it for steam as well. I'll put a link to an excellent video by Damian Witoński below. Next up is the 3D printed case. This is designed by Patrick Fermel and made available on Thingiverse.com. I provide the link to the file in the description below. All you need to do is find a local 3D printing service and send the STL file to them. The case itself is very well designed and fits the PID unit perfectly. It looks much, much sleeker than those dreaded aluminium enclosures. You're also going to need the temperature sensor. This one is of PT100 variety and has a threaded probe. This is M4 threading, which is great. It will thread right into the boiler where the original thermostat is located. The sensor features three wires, one for signal, two for shielding. The last important component of this is the solid state relay. It's a box with four terminals that goes inside the espresso machine. Terminals numbered 4 and 3 are used to connect the relay to the controller. Terminals 1 and 2 will connect to the cables inside Gaja Classic that currently connect to the thermostat. I chose a unit rated for 25 amps, which is plenty in this application. In order to hide all the cables connecting the machine and the PID, I'll be using a polyester cable sleeve. I chose this mainly for good looks, but it's also flexible and widely available. As far as cables are concerned, I went for the silicone variety. 
I mean, there is copper inside, but the insulation is made of silicone and hence the name. They are remarkably flexible, but above all, very resistant to high temperature that will occur inside the espresso machine. Especially the one cable running close to the boiler would need to be rated for high temp. For connections, I'll be using your standard insulated connectors. The only special connectors are those funny, splicey ones. I've heard them being referred to as piggyback connectors, which I find amusing. I'll be using them to power the PID off Gadget's own supply. The rest of them are a mixed bunch. I ended up buying more than I really needed. As for tools, the only specialty tool that I'm using is this crimping tool. This is used for crimping the connectors onto the wires. This is actually a very fast way of creating connections, much faster and easier than soldering, at least for me. And I can use it to take off insulation as well. My plan was to start with preparing the PID controller and all the cables in the form of a harness. I would then route all the cables through the rear vent holes in the machine and connect everything inside. It seemed like a good idea at the time, but turned out a big mistake. Do not replicate this. The problem was with the temperature sensor. It is too big to fit through the vents and I had to destroy the harness already made. It took me an hour to get to this stage, only to roll back again. I learned a valuable lesson though, the cable sleeve is a real pain to work with. It keeps unraveling and it was wise to order much more than I thought I needed. Keep that in mind if you select the same solution. Later on you'll see me using some adhesive tape to keep the sleeve together uh, while pushing the cables through. What you should actually start with is the machine itself. I'm quite comfortable working inside it because I had to unclog the three-way solenoid valve when the machine arrived and that required taking it all apart. Once you unscrew the top, pull it to the back and up. You'll notice there are two ground wires connected to the cover. Disconnect them by pulling gently. The ground wires should be tucked away to the side so they don't interfere with the rest of the process. With the insides now visible, it is advisable to number the connectors as I've done here. It could also help to take a picture before you start disconnecting things. Once the connectors are unplugged, I'll unscrew the boiler from the chassis. It's held in place by four bolts visible from the underside. Okay, so first pull the steam knob straight out. It's friction fit, so it should just slide off. Then, use a 17mm spanner to undo the nut holding the steam wand here. Uh, the steam wand can then be carefully routed down and out. All connectors can be pulled straight up, except the ground connector which is holding the thermal fuse. Remove the screw holding the fuse and the wire and move the thermal fuse to the side so it doesn't interfere with boiler removal. To start unscrewing the boiler, I like to place the gadget on its back. This way I have an easy access to the bolts. I loosen them all and then I turn the machine back up so I'm not working against gravity. Ok, that's four bolts removed and the boiler is now loose. Carefully lift it up by the steam valve. There are still two connectors that need disconnecting. They were previously hard to reach. With that done, I need to disconnect the hose from the pump and the solenoid valve. That's just four bolts again, nothing too difficult. Don't be surprised as you unbolt the solenoid valve, your boiler will start leaking water from the inside potentially making a bit of a mess. Let's clean this up and focus on the boiler. You'll notice there are two thermostats. Since I'll be using the PID just for brewing, I need to replace the lower one with the new temperature sensor. It takes a large 17mm spanner to unbolt this, but it is really a tiny M4 threading. Be very gentle and remember, lefty-loosey. 
The boiler is made of aluminium, a very soft material, so I'm always particularly careful when working with small threads in aluminium objects. For thermal conduction I'll be using this thermal paste I had laying around from some PC parts. You only need a tiny bit. I'm not entirely sure about its long-term performance because thermal paste dedicated for computers might be designed to work at lower temperatures, but I figured I'd take my chances. If you wish to err on the side of safety, shop for thermal compound designed for temperatures reaching 160 degrees. Threading the sensor in is a bit awkward because the cable is so long. Let's put the boiler to the side and focus on the machine again. The next step is borrowing some power for the PID unit. This model runs on 220 volts and that's what we need to deliver. So the first spot you need to focus on is the brown wire connected to the switch in the middle, the brew switch. Gently pull on the white cover and wiggle it slightly. It should come off eventually. You can see me using pliers to remove it, but I would recommend avoiding them if possible. Connect the power wire for the PID to the exposed contact and plug the brown wire to the piggyback connector. The second piggyback connector should be spliced into the blue wire at the socket in the back. It's the one at the bottom, so access is quite difficult. I had some problems taking this off and ended up mangling the white cover slightly. A flathead screwdriver saved the day. I was able to pry the plug off. I attached the second wire and routed both power cables outside. PID power source is ready. The next step is to put the boiler back into the machine. This requires some dexterity but isn't that difficult. The solenoid valve and pump hose should be connected first and once you get the bolts going it's all good. Carefully route all cables out of harm's way, make sure nothing is pinching anywhere. Route the temperature sensor cable out through the vent hole. Don't forget to put the black plastic cover on the steam valve before you start fixing things in place. I learned the hard way. From this point it's just a matter of bolting the boiler to the chassis and reconnecting all cables. The steam wand can also be reconnected at this point since it won't interfere with the rest of the process.
After connecting everything, you'll be left with two plugs that originally attached to the thermostat. These will need to connect to the relay and I'm gonna install it next. Here's the solid state relay. The thermostat cables need to connect to terminals 1 and 2. I intend to fix the relay to the back of the machine to the same vent hole I routed the cables through. The new Gadget Classics, or Gadget Classic Pro as they know in the US, aren't all made the same. My gadget was made in November 2018 and features the same funnel as the earlier Classics. At some point, however, Gadget redesigned the funnel and the newer ones are wider. If that's the case, uh, with your machine you will need to move the relay down and either bolt it to the chassis or stick it with some sort of adhesive or double-sided tape. Here I am preparing the wires to connect the relay to the cables that originally went to the thermostat. I'm using a thicker cable here, 1.5mm in diameter, because this is where a greater amperage is going to be present, along with full mains voltage. This connection needs to be sturdy and secure. Once they're plugged in, Gadja will know when to turn the heaters on. The relay is in place inside the machine and I'm using a small N3 bolt to attach it in place. Next order of business is the input line that connects the PID and the relay. It's a low voltage connection so I'm turning to thin silicone cables again. Ready-made wires are screwed to the relay and routed through the back. So now I've got a nice bunch of cables ready and the work on the machine internals is complete. For convenience I'm putting the machine on the side to use gravity to my advantage here. The next step is pretty annoying. I'm trying to put all cables inside the sleeve. This took some effort. In the end, the most efficient way was to push all cables through at the same time rather than manipulate them one by one. Adhesive tape is used to keep the sleeve together without fraying. I had to use a flathead screwdriver to push the sleeve through the vent.
We're getting to the final parts now. Before making any connections to the PID itself, the case needs to be pushed onto the wire harness. I can then carry on with connecting the cables to the temperature controller. The red wire goes to terminal number 8. The white wires need to be attached to terminals 6 and 7. Next, I'm connecting the PID output to the SSR input, observing polarity. Final connection is the power source attached to terminals 1 and 2 of the PID. Once I adjusted the length of the cables by pulling them inside the machine, I secured the entire harness with zip ties on both ends and closed the PID inside the enclosure. The gadget is ready. Some cable routing, connecting the ground wires to the top shelf and putting the funnel in is all that is left to do. Here I am turning the machine on for the first time after installing the PID controller. I was half expecting the need for some tweaks or initial problems with the boot, but it went smoothly right from the start. As the machine is heating up, let me go through the cost summary. The PID controller XMT7100 cost the equivalent of 17 euro or 21 US dollars. The solid state relay, branded Fotec and uh, rated for 25 amps, cost the equivalent of 2.5 euro or 3 US dollars. PT100 high precision temperature sensor cost the equivalent of 7 euro or 8.5 dollars. The enclosure which I had 3D printed locally cost 25 euro or 31 dollars and is actually the most expensive part of this mod. Cables, connectors, the magnetic tape and cable sleeve cost 12 euro or 15 dollars. I didn't have to buy the thermal compound nor any tools, so the entire mod cost a total of 63.5 euro or 77 US dollars. It could have been cheaper if I opted for aluminium enclosure, but as I explained in the beginning, the looks really mattered to me, so I thought it was worth spending a little bit more here. I did know that the PID needs to auto-tune its own internal algorithms in order to learn the boiler and heater characteristics. What I didn't know was that the process doesn't start automatically, at least it didn't in my case. In order to start auto-tuning, set your PID to 103 degrees and long press the second button, the arrow pointing right. The AT light will start flashing and the PID will spend about 15 minutes learning your gadget. And yes, 103 degrees is a good starting point, accounting for the discrepancy between the temp measured at the sensor and the temperature of the water inside the boiler. You might want to adjust it later to suit your coffee better. So, was it worth it? In short, yes. Yes, it was. 
the time between shots is much shorter now. I don't need to temperature serve or bump the temp before brewing. I know how hot the boiler is and whether or not I need to cool it down after steaming. But most importantly, the consistency of shots improved greatly. Once I allowed it to auto-tune, the PAD is able to keep the temp swings within 2 degrees from the set temperature throughout the entire brewing process. This is a huge improvement and well worth the effort. If you haven't seen it already, please watch that James Hoffman video about buying a secondhand espresso setup. My journey started with it. Huge thanks and shout out to the Majestic Bean channel who taught me the basis of a gadget classic and how to temperature serve before I got that PID. A huge thank you also to Damian Witoński, his YouTube channel and blog was of tremendous help as I went through this process. Thanks for watching. I hope you have a great day.